Welcome everyone to tune in to join us for January edition of the Samuel Lawrence Foundation's first Friday series webinar. This is the first one in this brand new year of 2024. Happy New Year to us. My name is Bart Ziegler. I'm the president of the Samuel Lawrence Foundation. The Samuel Lawrence Foundation advances impactful programs at the intersection of science, arts, and education, looking for solutions to our planet's greatest challenges. From greenwashing nuclear waste to climate change, we believe that by bringing incredible minds and incredible voices, together we can move from collaboration to action. Today's edition of First Fridays will be looking precisely at that, a wide range of global solutionists highlighting the most inspiring ideas that can make biggest difference to the world's most intractable problems. I'll turn this over now to our moderator, former uh, senior editor of Huffington Post, now CEO of Brooklyn Story Lab, Lance Gould, to moderate today's discussion and int introduce our wonderful panel of speakers. Lance, thank you. Thank you, Bart, and Happy New Year to all. So now it is 2024, and in addition to celebrating a new year, we're also mindful that we're one year closer to 2030. That's the deadline suggested by scientists and other experts as the date by which we need to adopt the UN Sustainable Development Goals, aka the SDGs, or face potentially irreversible negative consequences. Since 2020, these experts have been clamoring for solutions, and the UN responded by proclaiming a decade of action. So now we're four years into that decade of action with a tightening window on what we need to produce to overcome this massive challenge. But I don't want to start the new year on a negative note. And in fact, this is a feel good episode of First Fridays as we've assembled a team of experts with ideas that will play a role in discovering and nurturing solutions that will have a positive impact on all of us. Welcome panel. You can see all of, uh, all of our guests today. Uh, joining us today, we have Jacqueline Francis, founder and executive director of the Global Warming Mitigation Project, Nina Sora, who oversees program and partnerships at the Unleash Innovation Lab, Terry Torek, executive producer at Live from Earth Entertainment and co-founder of the Creative Intelligence Agency, aka the CIA, the other CIA, Vernita Adele White, fashion designer and founder of America's Hot Sauce, and Trisha McLaughlin, general manager of the Anthem Awards. Welcome to all. Each of the guests today is privy to a wide range of solutions from all over the globe or are themselves contributing to new ideas or innovative approaches that live up to the ideals of the SDGs, making sure no one on the planet is left behind by 2030. First, we'd love to hear a little more about the initiative with which each panelist is involved here, and then we'll learn more about some granular ideas that each has come across in their work. And that should give us all a lift of inspiration as we start a new year. Jackie, let's start with you. You founded the Global Warming Mitigation Project in Aspen, Colorado. Tell us about how this project got off the ground and about its basis in science. In science. So I'm, I'm actually gonna start with when I was 12 years old. Uh, I learned about the greenhouse effect. And this was now um, what we call global warming and uh, climate change. And so for a few years, I worked for the Aspen Science Center as the executive director, but I really wanted to get back to climate change because it was the most uh, difficult problem that the world was facing in, in my eyes. And so I went back to school, got a master's in energy policy and climate change. And um, through that program, I realized that really there are solutions all over the world and we needed to amplify them and, and elevate what they're doing. And so I became a solutionist by creating uh, the organization, the Global Warming Mitigation Project, which uh, has three different ways we look at elevating solutions. And we're going to talk a little bit more um, down the road about the prize, but we also have a internship program that we recently got over 6,000 applicants to do internships this spring for 49 jobs that we have. And so we're seeing so much demand for uh, people wanting to get into climate careers. And um, I, I started the organization just based on there's a demand for people who want to know what they uh, can do in this world surrounding climate change. And I feel like 
everything. Everything touches climate change in every single way. So that is why I started the Global Warming Mitigation Project. That's amazing. And, and kudos to you. I mean, you've, you're, you're really a pioneer in, in this work and, and what you've done is really outstanding. And from what I understand about the Global Warming Mitigation Project, there's sort of a, a con- there's, there's sort of three interlocking elements that all play off each other. You mentioned the internship, pro- internship program, which helps, pe- helps young people find jobs in the projects that win prizes. But tell us more about the prizes. One of the initiatives that the GWMP oversees is a science-based competition the Keeling Curve Prize, which awards $50,000 annually to each of 10 global projects that demonstrate the ability to reduce, replace, or remove greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. This is amazing. Tell us, tell us about the, the, the development of the Keeling Curve Prize and, and the whole constellation of, 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 uh, of other components to this organization. Yeah, the prize was our first program. And uh, it started seven years. This we're in our seventh year, so we've given out six years of prizes. And um, I created a advisory council that was extremely science focused. You know, we have um, professors and really high level people in the science world that were the early advisors that helped me design the prize. And I have 12 analysts that work for me from around the world that actually go through all the applications uh, pretty rigorous, rigorously and score and rank them. And that's how we come to the finalists, the 20 finalists. And then we have a team of judges that um, are mostly, you know, well-known people in the climate space, like, uh, you know, somebody from the UNFCCC, uh, people who are working in sustainable corporate jobs. And... Um, we have five categories, so it's sort of based on the Nobel Prize with categories in different areas that actually need to be recognized. And our five categories are energy, uh, carbon sinks, which are both uh, low-tech and high-tech, uh, nature-based and um, high technology, and then finance, social and cultural pathways, and transport and mobility. Um, and um, it's it's, it's open up to both nonprofit and for-profit. It's global. And uh, that's what gives value to the other two programs, which are the youth internship programs. And then we have a database that's uh, becoming a financial mechanism. That's amazing. And we're going to hear more later in the, in the program about some of the individual prize winners over the course of the last seven years, because you've, you've really discovered some incredible projects. Now we're going to move on to uh, Nina, uh, Nina, thank you for joining us today from Denmark, where you work with Unleash Innovation Lab. Unleash is an annual convening of young global change makers from all over the world. Tell us more about this initiative. Yes, thank you so much, Lance. Um, so Unleash is a global initiative that is committed to bringing together the world's top talented youth um, to develop solutions, uh, to build networks, and to engage partners in order to reach the sustainable development goals. So basically, we inspire, aspire to be the most inclusive platform for youth all around the world to co-create a more sustainable future. And we do this through four different programs. So our biggest one is the Unleash Innovation Lab. Every year, we host a big global or regional innovation labs that are there to develop innovative solutions for the sustainable development goals and to tackle the largest sustainability challenges we see around the world today. We host Unleash Hacks, which are localized innovation sprints uh, that target more community-related challenges and that are driven by our own community members. Uh, We have Unleash Plus, which is our global incubator for early-stage startups um, that already work with addressing the SDGs in some way. And lastly, we have our Unleash Ambassador Program. So this uh, is run by our own community members, Uh, People are from 70 different countries, I think, um, and they train our community of 8,000 global change makers in community leadership and sustainability and in innovation. Such an incredible program. Um, And uh, I think Unleash has been around for about the same number of years that um, that the uh, Keeling Curve Prize has about about seven years. And earlier this earlier last month, you had the first Unleash out uh, in Africa in Rwanda. Tell us about that experience. Absolutely. Uh, Yes, so Unleash has hosted Innovation Labs in six different countries now, I think. Um, But in December, um, last year it is now, uh, so just coming back from that, we hosted our first Innovation Lab on the African continent for the first time, which was super exciting. 
It was hosted in Kigali, Rwanda, which was very fitting as it is a bustling innovation hub in Africa. So basically what happens is that for one week, we bring together 1,000 youth from all over the world. This year, we had 136 nationalities present. Um, and we take these young people through the Unleash innovation process. Uh, we use some activity cards that are developed by us. And we have um, previous talents that are trained in human-centered design thinking to be facilitators that facilitate them through the process. And then they learn to frame problems, um, ideate solutions, and then at the end of the week to pitch these solutions to their peers, um, partners, and potential investors. Um, and for every destination that we bring Unleashed to, uh, we prioritize um, to have a strong regional representation so this year, when it was in Eastern Africa, we had very strong regional presence from Eastern Africa um, so that the solutions that are developed are strongly um, anchored in the lived experiences of African youth and are relevant in that way. So they have a lot of potential also to be implemented in those communities afterwards. Um, and, and, and all of these thing, ideas are also based, uh, just, just to emphasize this part, they're all entrepreneurial in, uh, in, in their foundation. So they're... they're they're all looking to um, uh, to to turn turn economic engines in that way, not as nonprofits that are uh, nice to haves, but these are actual solutions that can uh, generate jobs and and uh, and economic benefits in other ways as well. Absolutely. So we see a, a mixture of both. I mean, there are some social entrepreneurs, but they're definitely for profits that come out of Unleash afterwards. Um, some people take the skills that they get in Unleash and bring them back into their everyday life, if they're students, into their work. Some bring their ideas back into their companies or organizations and become entrepreneurs. So we see a range of different outcomes from having been part of Unleash. Um, and I have one other point I want to bring up, and that is Please. what makes um, Unleash unique. Uh, and I think that comes down to the diversity of our talents. Um, because when you bring together people from so many different countries, just really intensely in that, you know, creative brainstorming, um, this is when we really can see disruptive thinking happening. Um, you can imagine we put together teams of four or five people. If you bring, for example, an engineer from Peru with a farmer from Slovakia and a solar energy specialist from Singapore, what do you get? You get a lot of different world values, uh, different knowledge systems. Um, different backgrounds, different ways of thinking. And this is where you really get this disruptive thinking. You get the creative juices flowing. Um, and that is how we see that our talents develop some ideas in just one week um, that has a lot of impact potential. Um, and that is really what we need to reach uh, the SDGs by 2030. Time is ticking. We're halfway there. So we really need to get going if we were going to reach it. That's so true, and uh, I've had the privilege of of, of joining Unleash in, in some for some of the uh, uh, innovation labs in some of the different countries. And it's just mark remarkable to see how some of these people come together from from uh, like the example that you gave from a variety of countries and overcoming cultural differences to really come up with amazing solutions. Uh, Terry, very much in the same vein as Unleash is an organization that you've been working with for many years called Enactus where you were the chief innovation officer and you currently serve on the country board. Tell us more about this program. Yeah, thanks, Lance. And I really appreciate, Nina, everything that you shared at Unleash. It's powerful to get behind young entrepreneurs who are changing the world for good. And similar to Unleash, and Actus has been around for nearly 50 years. We're uh, really about investing in students who take entrepreneurial action for others. It creates a better world for us all. And it's a simple premise that if we put the same rigors around impact and measuring impact that we do with measuring income, then what kind of different world would it be? And we take on some pretty big topics, and Lance, you certainly do. And when we bring out to the world of climate change and challenges, we could be overwhelmed by the problems in the world. But we celebrate the solutions of the young minds that travel to an Enactus World Cup to present some amazing projects around the world. So in 33 countries, 11 of them are on the continent of Africa, reaching out to many more countries so that we can provide an all access to an actus. It's really the good work that, not unlike Unleash, that supports great young entrepreneurs or the entrepreneurial mindset. So 
when they do go into those places of work, they can take those same skills and that dream we all had at 20 years old should stay alive because the dream of changing the world for good should never go away. So when we can really help support and surround ourselves with love and tools and and, um, opportunities to build teams around young entrepreneurs and, and especially um, invest in them. It's really critical. And so it gives you hope. Uh, we can often get uh, overwhelmed in this world by being surrounded by great big giant problems, some of the worst of humanity of, you know, I've experienced over 30 years. But it only takes that spark of a young mind and a young heart who has an idea that can change the world for good. And that's where we should build a stage and surround those students with a lot of support and a lot of tools. So moving, Terry, you're, you're just, uh, your, your passion just comes through so beautifully and, uh, and Enactus is doing such important work. And just like Unleash, where they, there's a different host country every year for that event, you have a yep. different host country every year for your event. And yours this past fall, well, the World Cup, was in the Netherlands. Tell us more about that event. Yeah, so we just came from Utrecht. It was a long time in planning. In fact, we planned to have the World Cup in Utrecht prior to uh, COVID. And of course, like many organizations, we went online and we were ready to get back and roll up our sleeves and get together a year before it was in Puerto Rico. But what's really amazing is seeing 33 countries of young people get together out of hundreds of thousands and millions of, of alumni and the best of the best gathering. And while we see opportunities at the Enactus World Cup, in Utrecht, and we have a Final Four, and you know there was teams that definitely have a lot of resources. What I find amazing, Lance, are the small, quiet corners of the world. Places like Guatemala and Colombia and Iswatini, Zimbabwe, Nigeria, rolling up their sleeves and doing the work. Maybe not as many resources as some of our other countries, but they're of the community. And that behavioral change, this is an example of a team from Colombia who, by circumstances of exporting mass amounts of food, especially in the world of coffee and everything else, finds themselves in polluted water that they themselves can't drink. And sure, they could buy filters exported from China and other parts of the world, or they could look to their own local community for solutions. Here, they found it in a simple organism called mushrooms. And so they have put those mushrooms to work to create their own water filters, to shift their own behaviors, even against the odds of economics. But by creating a local circular economy, it changes their world. And whether or not that should scale around the world or just be applauded for looking at their world and making a change is debatable. But it's it's things like this that bringing out these stories, Lance, are really important. And I, I encourage us all to you know, like Unleash and what's happening in Aspen and that we get together like you so beautifully do, Lance, bring us together because we're out there in the world doing similar work. And yet oftentimes we find ourselves fighting for funding. But I also wonder, Lance, when we can bring our organizations together and one plus one can equal 11 and we can multiply our impact, how much more efficient and effective we can be in changing the world for good. That's so true. And I'm so glad that, again, uh, af- after this program, what I, I really encourage the five guests to stay in touch with each other because I, I, I bring, bringing, bringing organizations like this together is part of, the, part of this work. And uh, we have just six years to, to, to go before 2030, before the, this UN-imposed deadline of meeting the uh, 2030 agenda. And we really, as Nina said, we need to move quickly, we need to move fast, and, and, and we need to work collaboratively. Uh, just before I move on to Vernita, I just want to share a couple of incredible stats from Enactus. Enactus has been around for uh, just about 50 years. 1.5 million alum uh, has been as many as 36 countries. I think some countries have, have, have fallen off, like uh, from, from Eastern Europe, but uh, it engages about 72,000 72, students every year. So it's just really an incredible network. And I, I'm really looking forward to later in the program hearing more about granular ideas from Unleash, granular ideas like the Columbia uh, idea that Terry just shared and from the Killing Curve Prize and from and from, from our one of our next guests as well. But first, I'm going to come to Vernita. Uh, Vernita, you wear so many hats, artist, designer, activist, writer, environmentalist, uh, and you're, you're such a talented, uh, you're so talented at all of these. 
Your introduction to so much of this work came from tragic circumstances, though, in, in New Orleans. If you don't mind, would you please share with us the story that led to your getting involved in, in fashion and activism? Yes. Good afternoon, Lance and everyone. Um, excited to be here. Uh, my name is Bernita Adele. And as Lance alluded to, my first foray into this space and the work around climate change um, really came from my family's experience. Um, take it back almost 20 years to Hurricane Katrina. So my family is originally from New Orleans, Louisiana, and I loved everything that Nina was saying and Terry was sharing and Jackie was sharing, both from a, a diversity standpoint, which I want to circle back to, but then also around young people. Because when Hurricane Katrina hit, uh, I was just graduating from college. I was living in New York City. My entire family is from New Orleans, and I was looking for a way to make an impact and to get involved. So at that time, I started my first brand, uh, Human Intonation, which was an apparel-based brand using fashion as a vehicle, as a hook, as a way to raise awareness around the need for rebuilding efforts, um, not just only in New Orleans, but the Gulf Coast at large. And then that led to what started out as a fashion brand turned into a number of volunteer trips uh, where I organized people to go down to New Orleans and have hands on uh, volunteer efforts, actually with an organization called uh, Hands On Network, which then eventually became Hands On New Orleans, uh, specifically targeting the New Orleans area. Uh, Hands On Network is based out of Atlanta, and we had an opportunity to really family by family, home by home, address some of the rebu rebuilding efforts that were needed. And then um, this really cool thing happened is that I met Usher Raymond, who um, Grammy Award winning artist, uh, joined us in New Orleans for one of those volunteer trips. And I thought, you know, there could be something here because unfortunately, while this is an extremely important issue for us and all of the environmental issues that came out after Hurricane Katrina, um, having that spark um, to engage greater interest is something that uh, we have been working towards. Thank you for sharing all of that, Vernita. It's a, it's a really remarkable story, what, what you, you and your family went through and how you were able to persevere with this brand. And now uh, you have launched a new brand uh, called America's Hot Sauce. Tell us a little bit about that. Yes. So dovetailing off what I just shared about my experience with Human Nation and rebuilding efforts after Hurricane Katrina, a couple of things happened. Um, one, my I love fashion. Uh, I'm in the fashion space. And I also recognize that in many ways, that's kind of counterproductive to our climate change solutions, because the fashion industry is one of the most it's the second largest pollutant behind the oil industry. And yes, the fashion world is starting to do a lot of work to change that. But the reality is uh, the way that we treat fashion, the way that we treat clothing has pros and cons. The second piece to this is that out of my experience with New Orleans, I began to realize that there was this racial justice piece that needed to be attached to climate change. So while you know, all of New Orleans was impacted by Hurricane Katrina. Uh, historically, black and brown neighborhoods like the Lower Ninth Ward were disproportionately impacted, disproportionately unable to come back or disproportionately extended in the time that we were able to gain resources or clean water and things of those nature. And then it started making me look at, well, how does racial justice touch all of these other areas around climate change? Things like taking it out of New Orleans and into the Louisiana Cancer Corridor, which is a mile stretch between New Orleans and Baton Rouge, that is uh, his, that historically has had very toxic air because intentionally a lot of plants were put into that area. Uh, and then you kind of take it to this broader level where uh, we fast forward to 2020. Obviously, our nation here in the U.S. and then globally have really taken a next step in our work around race of justice following the murder of George Floyd. And for me, that led me to really go through my own reconciliation with race and the racism that I have faced as a black person in America. So that led me to um, fast forward. I, I published an article in the Daily Beast calling out systemic racism in corporate America. And out of that piece, very much the way Jackie touched on how climate change affects everything, that includes 
racism. And that put me on the road to look at what are the solutions from an anti-racism lens around climate change. And so um, America's Hot Sauce uh, comes out of that article, uh, the Daily Beast article, because still my, my favorite line in the article uh, touches upon the kind of historic exploitation of our Black star power, um, Black influence style, fashion, music by white brands to sell more products and services in corporate America, but they're not actually invested in uh, Black communities or Black people. And so when we talk about our hot sauce, uh, that is the foundation of all of the work that we're doing around anti-racism and uh, expressing to people that there are other ways that we can approach this conversation on how we collaborate and how we do the work towards achieving racial equity, including from an environmental landscape. Well, thank you for sharing that, Vernita. And like you said, uh, in terms of how in, in terms of how racism uh, touches everything and all all the problems that we're looking at now, so, uh, analogously as Jackie noted that climate change does as well. And if you look at the SDGs, the UN Sustainable Development Goals, there are 17 goal blueprint that really recognize the interaction between each of those 17 goals, whether it's education, health, uh, peace and justice, gender inequality or gender equality, uh, poverty, hunger, et cetera, et cetera. So thank you for sharing that. And it's really important for us to keep that in perspective when we're designing new solutions to make sure that no one is left behind. Um, now we're going to move on to Trisha, uh, the Webby Awards. Uh, Trisha is with the Webby Awards and the Webby Awards are a well-known arbiter of the best of the internet. And three years ago, the organization launched the Anthem Awards to recognize the very best of purpose and mission-driven work around the world. Tell us more about the Anthem Awards, Tricia. Yeah, thanks, Lance. So the Anthem Awards are focused on highlighting the most game-changing ideas and projects in the social impact space from across the globe. So we recognize the work of individuals, nonprofits, and companies across our seven different cause areas, and that includes DEI, education, arts, and culture, health human and civil rights, humanitarian action and services, responsible technology, and then sustainability, climate, and the environment. So under each of those areas, we offer around 65 different category options that really range from best use of technology to awareness campaigns to also kind of community events and really so much more. Um, we really try to aim to create a space that has a place for every single type of work um, so we can really be broad and celebrate everything that's happening under this giant umbrella that we call impact. Um, and over the past three years, we've also had the incredible honor of recognizing some really great leaders in the space from Gloria Steinem, Billy Porter, Amanda Gorman, Ben Cohen, Jerry Greenfield of Ben and Jerry's fame, um, and then also Jane Goodall. So really with everything we do, our main goal is to highlight this great work provide an opportunity for the change makers doing this work to celebrate their impact and take a moment to really pat themselves on the back. And then also to pro like just provide hope to the greater community that we've created that change is possible and just to see everything that's happening. Um, so even this year, we launched a community voice campaign um, to highlight all of our finalists. And that was really a great opportunity for a, the finalists themselves to put their work on a pedestal and really shout it out. And also for everyone else kind of coming into the end of the year and towards the holiday season to see hundreds of projects that are really having an impact and making a change across the globe. Um, so really just kind of that feel good feeling um, that we're able to create here. And then this year we have our winner's announcement coming up later this month on January 30th. And then we'll also kick off our fourth season later this year in the spring. So very exciting. Amazing. And and what struck me about the Anthem Awards is, is you mentioned 65 different categories within each of seven different areas. I mean, it, the comprehension of these awards is amazing. It's just, mm -hmm. it, it covers so much ground and, and really does a great job of recognizing the, you know, from large to small, for, you know, the, all the different types of great work that are being done out there. What has been the response so far to the Anthem Awards in, in terms of participation? Yeah, I mean, it's been really strong. So we've received more than 6,000 entries from 40 countries around the globe. And then in addition to that, for our judging body, we have around 700 different industry leaders um, that are judging the competition each year. So it's been incredible to see the response in just three years, which is such a tiny amount of time in the grand scheme of this. Um, and we've grown this incredible um, cross-sector community of leaders in the impact space, but we're just getting started. <laughs> Just getting started. And uh, among the five of the guests today, just it's hard to imagine a country that isn't covered 
by 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 the by the uh, by by the work that uh, of, of all the in of all the people involved in Unleash and in Enactus and the Anthem Awards and the Killing Curve Prize and and and, and what Vernita is doing. It's just unbelievable to see. Um, so thanks to thanks to all of you for sharing your current project. Now let's hear more about some of the amazing ideas that have emerged from your organizations. Uh, Nina, Unleash has taken place in Denmark, Singapore, China, Greenland, India, and now Rwanda. Tell us about some of the best ideas to come out of Unleash and some of the interesting people who've participated in it. Thank you, Lance. Um, yeah, that's a tough question because uh, since Unleash was um, launched in 2017, um, we have developed uh, 1,200 solutions to address the SDG so far. So there's a lot to choose from, um, <laughs> in other words. Um, and some, you know, take their ideas um, and use it as a starting point and create a spin-off and then create another startup. Some take it to market to launch it um, and some bring their ideas back to their companies, like I mentioned previously. So the ideas come out in a lot of, uh, or flesh out in a lot of different ways. Uh, but I thought I'd bring up a few examples uh, today um, of teams that worked through the Unleash innovation process and then created a startup um, that in one way or another addresses the SDGs. Um, so one of them is called the Acofresh. Um, they have implemented a solar power cold storage system uh, in rural communities in Ghana uh, because a lot of the smallholder farmers had produce that went to waste because it couldn't get stored before it got sold on the market and they could get money for their harvests. And what they've seen is that it has decreased post-harvest losses by 50% and increased food supply by 15%. So addressing the SDG related to zero hunger, amongst others. And we also have another startup called Permolution that came out of Unleash. Um, so they looked at areas with uh, freshwater scarcity and they developed a technology to capture fog that could turn the fog into water and then use it uh, for local agriculture um, and in ecosystem conservation in Mexico. And then finally, I wanna mention another idea. Um, it's something called One Day Health. Um, they were part of Unleash back in the day. Um, mm -hmm. And they target uh, healthcare black holes in rural Uganda. So what they do is that they train um, local nurses and then they equip them with 50 essential medications that treat 30 of the most uh, common uh, medical conditions that exist in the areas. Um, and then they launch mobile primary health care centers in one day. Um, so, so far, 30 healthcare centers have been established in these healthcare black holes where people do not get access to medical treatment because they live too far away. It costs too much money to transport themselves to a hospital to get treatment. Um, and they have now so far treated 100,000 people. So these are some examples of solutions that have come out of Unleash. Um, and especially we can see that it targets the, um, you know, local and hyper local scale uh, quite a lot because a lot of our talents that go through our programs, they they live through, this is their reality. Um, so it's based on their lived experiences. It really targets the user. Um, and we can really see that the impact potential is is super high. Um, of the ideas that have come out of our labs. Those are amazing ideas. And what I love about uh, what I love about these ideas, particularly the first and the third idea, permolution is a little bit harder on, uh, for what I'm about to say, but the scalability of being able to mm. replicate that and, and, and take the entrepreneurial idea and the entrepreneurial spirit here and replicate it and scale it is just so promising for, for the rest of the world. If something works in Ghana, it, it could well work in many other places that uh, that that are participating in Unleash. Um, exactly. Jackie, uh, oh, go ahead, Nita, I'm sorry. No, I was just confirming. Yes, that's also <laughs> what we see. Um, so that's incredible that it can be implemented in other parts of the world as well. Absolutely. And Jackie, uh, since 2018, the Killing Curve Prize has awarded more than $1.75 million to 60 nonprofits, for-profits, and startups in five different categories. Tell us about the collective impact of these projects and about some of the projects that stand out the most to you? Okay, so yeah, that, that 1.75 million is what we've given out, but that's turned on to, into additional money raised um, on the nonprofit and for-profit side of around $2 billion. Amazing. So the multiplier effect of what we're doing with like identifying and then also using our other sort of arms of the organization to help promote, give visibility, capacity building, 
has actually been a, a model that's just, I'm so proud of because it works, you know, really like identifying great organizations and then helping them to get across the valley of death in both the nonprofit and the for-profit spaces. So it's been really amazing to see, you know, the success stories. And um, we're talking about a couple of those now, just like one of our early winners is a publicly traded company now. And it's just amazing, amazing to see that growth. A another one won the Audacious Prize from uh, the TED organization and went from having like a $2 million a year budget to having like a $13 million a year budget. So it's really neat to see, you know, the, the multiplier effect that we can bring to these organizations. And, and can you, I, I know it's probably hard to pick among this, the, uh, among your 60 children, it's hard to pick a favorite, but is there any that stand out to you in terms of the innovation or technology and what, what it's actually doing granularly? You know, I, I have so many fun ones because there's <laughs> 60 plus our finalists, but like a couple, one of them is, is Clip, which has this um, contraption that they put on any kind of a bike and they can turn it into a propel, the propellion system that is a self-propelled electric bike contraption. Wow. And they're rolling it out in um, India and then probably in other places like in Kenya and, and places where there's a lot of need for people to be able to get around and, you know, adding this assistance to any kind of bike is just a fabulous idea. And then another one I'm going to mention too is these um, solar hubs all throughout Africa that become community centers because they put the, the solar power on the roofs and then people from all over the, uh, the area, the region will come charge up all their things, pay a small amount of money because they're actually sharing the cost of this and then go back and uh, be able to like power their, their homes in the evening and, you know, help with any kind of other, um, power systems that they need. And this also brings a community aspect. And again, just like with Nina's and Unleash, the scalability here of being able to replicate these successes and, and, and uh, throughout the rest of the world. And can I just add that I wanted to say to Terry that the water systems, they should be scalable because that's a need. And it's really cool to be able to highlight what somebody's doing somewhere and then show other people how to do it as well and to scale up things that are you know helping humanity. Thank, well, thank you for that segue, Jackie, because then we'll go, we will go to Terry. And Terry, Enactus has a, a very rich history. As we mentioned, more than 1.5 million students have taken part in almost 50 years in 36 countries. Tell us about some of the ideas that stand out to you over the course of Enactus's half a century of work. Well, I love the overall range of ideas that students also work with other organizations, including Enactus, to move from AI to CI using a creative intelligence and the resources they have. So we see some great ideas from high to low tech to no tech at all. So uh, a tech solution landed this year in France, and it was a young man who grew up with dyslexia. And growing up with dyslexia and being a slow learner is one thing, but the stigma around issues like this is often goes unmeasured. So he created a simple app on his phone that could help any dyslexic students see differently and, and see in a way that he could read and understand and keep up with others. But he went a step further and he broadened it so anybody without dyslexia could also appreciate and understand and have access, which reduced stigma and actually made it more fun, even now working on AI and gamifying it. One of the ideas that went from perhaps no tech to some tech to high tech is crosses organizations where a group in Canada was figuring out how to how to melt recycled plastic into 3D printing. And instead of um, creating products and then selling them, they decided to outsource the actual process. So when our team in Guatemala picked up on that, they started to create jewelry and opportunities for the local economy. Then it went a step further when they outsourced it to a group making prosthetics. That group then provided prosthetics for people missing limbs in villages, um, not only in sub-Saharan Africa, but throughout parts of Eastern Europe, etc. And then a group of artists came along and said, wait, what if we add fashion? And what if we make those prosthetics into superhero, super cool prosthetics that really are something to um, not only behold and hold, but something to brag about and make it more fun, reducing stigma, 
you know, quote unquote, normalizing it. So I love when students are working across other organizations, outsourcing and sharing. It just is such a spectacular, enlightening hope for the future. And sometimes, Lance, you know, when we hang these 20, 30 goals over our heads, we're like, that's a big, giant, heavy weight. But man, these are breakthrough weightless ideas that, you know, the work that uh, you're doing with fashion, Vinny, that's amazing. These are the simple things that we can do to change perceptions, change the world for good. And just these little behavioral changes come into big shifts. And we changing this or this next generation and the generation after it, that will stick. That will change forever. Plastic's only been around for 60 years or so. We can eliminate it in the next six Incredible. So we talked about scalability and here. This is almost like a catalyzing collaboration between from it's it, it talk about going viral, you know, an idea going from one country to another, to another, to another it, it, iterating along the way. It's just like, what, what a great story that is, Terry. Thank you for sharing well, it's that. A funny thing. I'd love to ask my other colleagues what they, what they think about that. But sometimes we set up competitions and competition really promotes creativity and, and, but it often creates a protection around IP, which has many great assets. But when you have a competition that actually outsour- that open sources and, and, and promotes sharing and sharing having more, it's spectacular. So I think we're seeing a, a great, you know, you've titled this Game Changers, but we can also change gamers. And we can <laughs> gamify our future in Love ways that. fun and fantastic. And hey, if we're not having fun, what on earth are we doing here? Exactly, Terry. You're you're it's, you're, you're you're such an inspiration. You are you it's your you, your joy is viral, uh, Patricia or Tricia. In the Anthem Awards, three years. What are some of the ideas that have most inspired you, and that and, and that recognition by the Anthem Awards has helped propel to further success for those uh, for those uh, ideas and for those organizations. Yeah, so we actually have just announced our finalists for this year in December. Um, so I'd love to just kind of highlight some of those projects that really Please do Absolutely. To me this year. Perfect. Um, so kind of starting on the small but mighty side of things, um, the Green Bronx Machine is a two-time Anthem winner and their team of three is really transforming the way that educators in New York City and across the country discuss and address food insecurity, workforce development, and food access. So through their YouTube channel, and they've also been able to recently develop partnerships with PBS and New York City Public Schools, the organization has impacted millions of children and educators through their content community garden initiatives. So really kind of getting out on the ground floor and providing those resources that really wouldn't otherwise be available to these students in these schools. And then kind of following that up, this year we received an entry from a group of students at Lafayette College as well, and they worked together to organize something really cool, which was the first ever electric plane stadium flyover. So these students went ahead and did all of the dirty work to really even find a plane that they could use. Um, They sourced Ford electric trucks to use as on-the-go charging sources and handled a million different logistics in between. So this was really cool to see their passion for bringing this new technology to a public space. And I think it also points to that commitment that Gen Z has for really elevating the climate crisis and finding new solutions. Um, And then the last project that I'll mention today is an app called Food Rescue Hero. Um, So it's estimated right now that 40% of the food in the U.S. is wasted while 12% of people face food insecurity. So they're trying to meet things in the middle and have created kind of a DoorDash in reverse um, (laughs) where volunteers can sign up and collect that surplus food from restaurants and grocery stores and then take it and deliver it to the kitchens and food pantries to redistribute. So, so far, um, they're aiming to add 10 cities into their program each year, hitting around 100 by 2030. And at that rate, they'll be able to save 2.5 billion pounds of food. So really fantastic work all around. And I'm just really proud that myself and the Anthem Awards can be there to help elevate these projects and shine a light on their work. Thank you for selecting those three, because uh, th- I know that there's um, there, there is such a range of ideas from, from the mm-hmm. from the massive to, to the to the small. And the, these small ideas are just so wonderful. And so, it's so great to give them the oxygen that they need to get more attention. So thank you for sharing those. Um, Renita, in your work uh, in anti-racism, what environmental projects have you seen that have most impressed you and where is that work taking place? Sure. So, of course, I'm going to start with uh, America's Hot Sauce. So as an anti-racism brand, um, as an apparel brand, you know, my roots really were thinking about how do we make fashion more sustainable? And when I started my first brand, I did all the things, you know, I said, 
how do I source organic cotton and how do I find um, environmentally friendly processes for my manufacturing, all of that. But there was a key piece that I had missing at that time. And that was looking at how do I meld fashion sustainability with anti-racism work. And so now I have a big goal dream is how can I have America's hot sauce as a merch collection have an entirely black supply chain, which in my work thus far, uh, with even more tailored focus to a U.S. black supply chain. Because if I go internationally, yes, you can do it. I can find um, black farmers and looking at raw materials. But I want to be 360, have America's hot sauce from the raw materials coming out the ground all the way how to we either upcycle or recycle our garments back into the earth long term. But how do I do that with an entirely black supply chain here in the U.S.? Because we still have a lot of work to do where there are certain segments of that supply chain that have historically been blocked out. So we're working towards on what is it going to look like and what does it take to create an entirely black supply chain um, as a fashion company in, in conjunction with the sustainability work. Um, the second piece that I wanted to touch on is, um, so some of our products, you know, like I'm wearing our Black Queen Thriving um, uh, sweatshirt today, is thinking about um, how does, how is the climate uh, work impacted by personal responsibility and self-actualization? So um, underpinning uh, America's Hot Sauce is the concept of Black people thriving. And it's thriving on all cylinders, physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, financially, culturally, in our relationship and environmentally. Because with the physical piece, you know, if you are in a community with food deserts, then what's the part of the solution is being able to start a community garden, learning to grow your own food. If you are in parts of the world or parts of the country that have um, disproportionately been to pollutants. So for example, I will also mention projects like uh, Philly Thrive that is, you know, doing the work to take back and, and with clean air initiatives. Um, also give a couple other fashion uh, shout outs to uh, Patagonia that has long been, uh, had a history of giving back to climate change. I love they have been intentional. And that's what so much of the solutions with anti-racism is being intentional about understanding that while climate change impacts everyone, it has and continues to disproportionately uh, impact black and brown communities. And as a fashion company, it, it recognizes that in its work and with its, um, it, with its climate initiative. Um, last thing at the local level, I want to uh, give a shout out to uh, an organization or really a retailer called Art to Wear, uh, founded by a black woman. Her name is Leslie Ware, and uh, she's all about upcycling. So she has brought a collective of diverse uh, fashion designers, creatives, and they have um, in her shop everything in her shop, which are you know both locations are in Manhattan. Uh, you can find a really really creative, well done, thoughtful pieces that might take an old pair of jeans from the 1980s and turn it into a really cool jacket that you can wear today. So those are some of the things we're looking at. Thank you for sharing all those, Vernita. And, and what I love hearing about all five of you speak consecutively is I think that, Vernita, some of the some of the things that you've mentioned would be great uh, 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 applicants for Unleash or for Enactus. I think that some of the people who've taken part in Enactus and Unleash can move on to the Killing Curve Prize. I think all of these work, all of the work can be recognized by the Anthem Awards. And there's really kind of a virtuous cycle here where the Anthem Awards could surface something that we might not know about. And maybe that becomes part of Unleash or Enactus. And maybe that moves on to uh, the Killing Curve Prize. So I, I, I love seeing uh, how this all could be related to each other. And all of your great work can really supplement each other and, and raise each other up. Um, I have a few more questions, but I'm also conscious of time and I want to see if we have any questions from the audience. So let me check in with Bart for a second and see if we have any uh, questions from the people watching. Oh, yeah. Good afternoon and evening. What a Lance, what a phenomenal show. And I think we're going to do our next newsletter. We're going to highlight each of these uh, five groups and add their most important 
impressive uh, component they shared with us today. And then people can easily just push a couple of buttons and get onto these groups that, that you put together so phenomenally. We have a problem here. And the one thing about this talk is everyone's uplifting with some ingenious ideas. But I'm going to talk just for a half a minute about this nuclear waste issue that's been greenwashed around the world. Um, nuclear industry, will, nuclear industry will will suffocate on its own, on its own merit because it's just too expensive compared to all the renewables like solar and battery storage and and wind. But we had, I was wondering if I could pitch to unleash and enact us. Actually, this is what from an audience member would unleash or enact us consider having their communities come up with a solution to the huge issue of nuclear waste. That's a question. <clears throat> Well, let, 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 let me start off uh, uh, and, and, and just add one thing, which is that usually all of the ideas that come out of Unleash and Enactus come uh, organically out of the participants. But, but, um, but Terry or Nina, do you want to address the idea of has anyone ever brought up nuclear energy as a uh, nuclear waste as, as an issue? And, and is anyone solving for that in your communities? And uh, let me just add that. I didn't read the question exactly, but it says at the decommissioned San Onofre nuclear generating station in Southern California, 3.6 million pounds of high burn up nuclear waste are stored in degrading thin walled steel canisters 100 feet from the Pacific Ocean above multiple earthquake faults and a tsunami zone. And then the question is, can unleash or enact us? figure out a solution that that is a disaster waiting to happen as bart noted there's there's tons of nuclear waste stored at sea level in 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 deteriorating caskets like in a nuke in, in a earthquake fault zone so good luck with that but um but uh but yeah has, has anyone ever dealt with nuclear waste in either in actus and leash or or in in uh in the anthem wards or uh in, in jackie in your work as well nuclear waste is an issue well, there's nothing more fun than missing, mixing uh, nuclear waste with uh, young students. But <laughs> low anybody, it is those kind of challenges that when you put into young minds and you provide the tools for them to think about it in a um, in an in a in a in an understanding with with the right amount of insights, it's powerful. Needs assessment is critical at Enactus. I'm, I'm sure it is at Unleash. But what we do do, and you mentioned it, Lance, is that it's really important that students come up with solutions to problems they're passionate about. Because the problem-solution world is good and fine, and you can see plenty of problems in the world. But if you're not passionate about the problem or solution, then what are you doing, man? Because the investable opportunity is the ones that are passionate and living it. But nuclear waste big topics when we have challenges that are put up by funders or sponsors in the, in the, in the spirit of a prize, those prizes that are also on the panel are great solutions to conquer big challenges like this. And no two, no challenge is too big. Um, let, let them add it. I can't speak on behalf of them, but if they're passionate about cleaning up nuclear waste, you know, my son once said to me, it's like, dad, you guys threw a party for 30 years and you expect us to, clean it up. And I thought about it. It's like, yeah, pretty much all <laughs> done. Clean up your room while you're at it. But, you know, and all kidding aside, um, we can take on big challenges. Like there's no challenge too big. We created it. We can solve it. Nina, do you have any thoughts on that? And, and, and while you're thinking about that, Nina, um, uh, it occurs to me that Unleash has specific hacks that they, that they execute around particular topics. Like uh, you did an Antarctic Nordic uh, hack where you had specific ideas for that. So, is, do you want to address that as as looking at larger problems through through that as a solution? Absolutely, um, and I, I second that completely, Terry. What you said. Um, so, when we host our innovation labs, um, they are uh, we target uh, SDGs um, that are um, decided upon in collaboration with our local partners. So one topic we often target is renewable energy or energy in general. Um, then the talents, if they're super passionate about something underneath that as a subtopic, then they begin in working on problem or framing a problem around that. So that could be nucle nuclear waste, for example. Um, and also, like you said, Lance, we organize Unleash Hacks. 
So that is when someone has been, for example, a talent at a lab, they come back to their local community if they're super passionate about developing solutions um, to combat nuclear wastes, then they can gather uh, the community around them and take the Unleash methodology that's free to use uh, for everyone um, for nonprofit purposes um, and then go through the methodology and come up with new ideas and think out of the box and think in new ways um, and how to target this issue. So, so no issue is too big or too small. This is definitely something that's spot on and that we also need to target if we're going to reach the SDGs by 2030. So, so definitely. And if, if the person asking the question uh, in the audience wants to do that, then, then feel free to reach out to Unleash. I go to unleash.org and, and uh, let's see what we can make happen. Great answer, Nina. And uh, Bart, uh, do you have any other questions from the audience? Well, this has sort of already been answered by those two wonderful people. How can listeners, the public, get involved in driving innovation and solutions to address these mm -hmm. huge global problems. Is there any way for the general public to submit problems, ideas, research, or pressing concerns to your organizations? And so we'll, yeah, it'll be great. We'll put on but a Vernita, do you want to tackle that? Like, do you want to say, like, how, how can local people, get, uh, how, how can people get involved on a local level? And then, and then we'll give uh, Jackie and Trisha a, 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 an answer as well. Um, okay, sure. Well, I would say, you know, definitely feel free to reach out to me after this, uh, event and I see a couple of folks in the comment. I'm happy to leave my contact information, but we're at America's Hot Sauce.club. And then I love tacking on, you know, think about what areas that you are passionate about because as we've all talked about today, you know, as we're approaching climate change, and I also love the SDG around reducing inequities, it, we're, it's a big piece. You know, it's like, you know, whether we're talking about air or water or food. Um, think about, I would say first, think about what maybe area you're most passionate about and then look at your local uh, organizations that are doing that work to reach out to, connect with. Um, it's, there's always great opportunities to do volunteerism. And then um, from there, usually once you're in an organization, they'll be able to guide you on like how you can best get involved. And also don't be afraid to use your talents. You know, Lance mentioned about me using being a designer, uh, a writer. Sometimes, uh, let's say you're like, I don't have all the solutions, but you can write about them. You can amplify. You can be part of uh, extending the message. So just think about your talents, and there's a lot of ways that we can impact this problem. Jackie, how about you? Do you want to weigh in on that? So first of all, I can't wait to try this, the hot sauce. <laughs> <laughs> But what I'm going to say about the Global Warming Mitigation Project, you can go uh, to gwmp.org and apply for the prize. I mean, we don't look for ideas. We look for actual projects. And um, that's, that's how you get in our database. And then with the database, um, we're rolling out all, all kinds of other uh, suite of services to help people out there. Um, and this is a way that we can actually like make sure whatever you're doing meets the kind of standards we're looking for, which is you know, scalability and, and efficacy and strength of your team and everything. But once you get in our system, it's like a humongous family and we support you in so many ways. And we continue to try and do it in whatever ways we see are most effective, pretty much 100% focus on the climate change issue because that's what we focus on. But um, as far as things like, you know, the other problems, nuclear waste, it, I just, it's all connected. It is. And uh, Trisha, I'm going to move on to another question and have you, have you take the lead on this one. But uh, um, from all of the patterns that we see emerging, uh, it, from all of the ideas that, have, that are coming forth, do you see any patterns emerging in, in, in these solutions? I mean, I think a big thing that we've already touched on today, too, is data sharing and really kind of opening up the communication pathways between organizations doing the same work. Um, I think that's something we focus on at the Anthem Awards with the cross-sector approach that we have, bringing together companies and for-profit organizations alongside grassroots organizations and international nonprofits all into the same room to talk about these changes. And I think in that same vein, I think we're definitely going to see a lot more coming into the space with AI. Um, that is definitely a technology that's here to stay. And I think it, now it's just figuring out how to harness this technology to really 
help create new solutions and find pathways that we can utilize to kind of find solutions quicker and to share them out and to really duplicate efforts and to really keep things moving. Thank you for sharing that, uh, Tricia. And now we're going to have one question that, that I'd like everyone to answer, uh, not at the same time. Uh, let's end on a hopeful note. What gives you each hope that we will meet the challenges of the decade of action and come up with solutions to address these enormous, enormous obstacles? Uh, Jackie, let's start with you. Uh, well, the Keeling Curve Prize is open right now. So I'd love to get all you guys to send out the information to your networks and, you know, maybe talk more about that. I mean, I see amazing solutions every day coming across my desk and it's so fabulously exciting. And I love being in the, in the place where we're about so, so the solutions and also how to like really pull more money into this space. So I think what I'm most excited about is seeing um, coming off of COP28 in Dubai, seeing how much money is starting to like flow into this space and how many more people are interested in investing and how many more young people are interested in climate careers and getting involved. So I, I am very lucky because I get to see this on a daily basis. And there's so much enthusiasm about moving forward in all kinds of ways to make our planet better. Thank you, uh, Jackie. And moving clockwise, Nina? Yes. Um, so I think when you're super passionate about sustainability and you want to make a difference um, and you enter the innovation space, you may sometimes think that, okay, I need to come up with the next big thing, like the next internet or something like that. <laughs> um, and to those people, I just want to come with a reminder that is that innovation doesn't have to be groundbreaking. Because if you make improvements um, or think out of the box um, within existing inventions, structures, systems that we have to be, you can still make a huge difference in making things more sustainable and more efficient. So everything helps. Um, and then I also want to reiterate my point previously about um, diversity, because I really, really believe that when you put together young people with a lot of different perspectives um, and worldviews, that is when you really get those creative juices flowing and you really challenge each other's perspectives. And that is when the brainstorms get really interesting and really strong. Um, and that is when you get some, some true disruptive thinking and some high impact ideas. Um, and I think that when we work as everyone here presents uh, today with sustainability initiatives, um, we have the power to um, to structurally and ensure diverse participation um, or hand out awards or bring people in uh, to your organization. So I think that is a big power that we should honor um, and make sure that we bring in a lot of different people um, and come together um, so that we actually can target these sustainability issues we're sitting with today. Such important points, Nita, thank you. And uh, Trisha, how about you? Giving you hope. Yeah, I think something right now is just kind of seeing the commitment of Gen Z and Gen Alpha coming up. We have this these two generations that are kind of coming up hyper aware of what's going on. Um, and I think a big part of that is the power of social media. And they're really just hitting the ground running from such young ages. You can see it in even the environmental groups that are being created globally, like the Climate Cardinals and groups like that. And so I think seeing the passion and power in this next generation is really something where I think we're going to get some great solutions. Thank you so much. And Vernita, how about you? For me, I think hope is on a couple of different areas. One is knowing that we're just getting started. You know, America's hot sauce is, is new and in the startup phase, and there's so much opportunity to see how it's going to form and evolve. And so I'm really excited for some of the ideas that we have this year. And then I think the other thing is, I would say is community. Um, I think the backbone to our brand is that we are building a community uh, with America's Hot Sauce, not only of like-minded people, but this idea of <clears throat> self-actualization. And so all are welcome. I think that's all, we always want to reiterate, you know, when we talk about anti-racism work, it really requires all of us from all backgrounds to be part of the process. So all are welcome into the America's Hot Sauce community. And um, what I know is that I'm excited for new products to come out <laughs> and I'm excited for more initiatives and uh, the best is yet to come. 
That's amazing. It's, it's so it's so exciting to watch the trajectory of your of your of your company. So so uh, keep going with that. Congratulations on that. And Terry, how about your what, what's giving you hope? I'll double down on my hope around SDG ten and diversity. And in diversity, we can find unity. And and the more diverse ideas, opportunities we have, then abundance breaks out. We don't have to eliminate humans. We need to embrace them, all of them, and especially neurodiversity. I have a, a son, neuro, neurodiverse, on the low end of the autistic spectrum, and another son who's a, a YouTuber. And I, I just, you know, the opportunity to entertain change. We can make it fun and game changers and changing games. And we're, um, I did a little product placement here. So I don't have my, my Black Queen shirt on, but it's super cool. But <laughs> we're getting a game of abundance with Dr. Deepak Chopra. So we've gamified change in community, uh, two aspects that are really important, bringing uh, community together. And also we have the game of Gratitude, uh, which is both um, tech, high tech and low tech opportunity to share more gratitude as I, I can't help but do it with this group here. Lance, you always bring together remarkable human beings and so humbled, but this is about community and hey, never doubt a small group of committed citizens to change the world it's the only thing that ever has and um it's a powerful quote and i live by it and uh, i'm really deeply grateful and i'm wildly hopeful that's amazing and all of you are so passionate about what you're doing and i want to make sure that the that the listeners the, and the viewers today and the viewers who will come on next week in, in in bigger droves will be able to get in touch with all of you so on the samuel lawrence website next week when we post this video we will have links to all of your organizations so I want to thank all five panelists for this important conversation and for sharing your findings here today. You're all doing such important work with consequences that seem bound to have more impact on our future than ever before. Uh, that concludes our program today. To rewatch the webinar or to go see a transcript, go to the Samuel Lawrence Foundation website in the coming days, probably by Monday or Tuesday of next week. The website is samuellawrencefoundation.org. Thank you so much to the Global Warming Mitigation Project and the Keeling Curve Prize. Unleash Unleash Innovation Labs, Enactus, the Anthem Awards, and to America's Hot Sauce for their participation in today's event. To learn more about the critical work that all participating parties are doing, as I've noted, to advance renewable energy and other sustainable initiatives, and to stay informed about upcoming events and important initiatives, sign up for the newsletters of the Samuel Lawrence Foundation and for Brooklyn Story Lab at brooklynstorylab.net. Also, make sure you join us for the next Samuel Lawrence Foundation First Friday series in February. Thank you all again, and goodbye. And Happy New Year.